Good afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. Um, these recordings will become available on our Dent Echo website um, after the session. We are very excited to have all of you join us for the 18th Dental Education Network for Texas, or um, known as Dent Echo. Um, this session is brought to you in collaboration by the Texas Association of Community Health Centers and UT Health San Antonio Dent Echo. My name is Kato, and I will assist in facilitating today's session. Um, next slide, Jackie. Thank you. And here is our agenda for today. We'll start off with some introductions and announcements, then move on to didactic presentation by Dr. Narayan, followed by case presentation from Dr. Randa Eta with time for Q&A. Next slide. And some housekeeping notes before we get started. These sessions are recorded for later distribution on our Dent Echo website. Um, please stay muted unless you are speaking. You can also use the chat to raise questions and share your perspectives anytime during the session. Um, the slides and recording will be made available on our Dent Echo website um, after the session. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat. Um, and I see that a lot of people have already done so, so thank you so much. And please remember that no personal health information is allowed in either the chat or our discussions. And if you would like any assistance with your connection throughout the session, um, please chat Jackie um, on a lovely Dent Echo IT. Next slide. Thank you. And for those who may be new to Echo, this is a model that builds virtual communities of practice and learning. Sessions include a didactic presentation and de-identified case-based learning and group discussion to foster deep knowledge and build individual capacity. ECHO is an all-teach, all-learn supportive model, and ECHOs thrive on the interaction from the full learning network. So we encourage all to participate in the conversation today. We also encourage you to join by video if you can, especially during discussion portion of the session. Next slide. And to receive CDE credits, uh, please make sure to do two things. One, Register through SMILE, which you can do so now using the link in the chat, Thank you. And or by scanning the QR code. And two, be on the session throughout the duration of the presentation. Um, when registering, please use the super code um, ECHO2024. Um, thank you, Jackie. Um, please unshare the slides. Thank you. And with that, let's move on to some introductions. Um, Kathleen? Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kathleen Weeks and I'm happy to be part of the Dent Echo Hub team. I'm currently the project coordinator here at the School of Dentistry. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chawla. Hi there. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to attend. And I'm Suman Chawla, Associate Dean for Advanced Education Programs at UT Health San Antonio. And Dr. Marwaha. Everyone, this is Dr. Marwaha, and I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Comprehensive Dentistry and assistant director for the Dental Public Health Residency Program. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. And I will now pass the mic over to Dr. Dar to introduce herself and also our speakers. Thank you so much, Ms. Kawasaki. I'm Shohini Dhar, assistant professor with the Department of Comprehensive Dentistry and one of the hub team members. It's my absolute pleasure this afternoon to introduce our esteemed speakers for this Denteco session. Uh, Dr. Narayanan is, uh, is the director of the pre-doctoral oral and maxillofacial surgery program here at our school, and he holds the position of associate clinical professor within the department. Dr. Narayanan has extensive professional experience, both internationally and nationally, and he has been actively involved in the design and advancement of innovative teaching approaches within pre-doctoral programs across the country. Welcome, Dr. Narayanan. Our case presenter for today is Dr. Landeta. Dr. Landeta is a clinical assistant professor at the Department of Maxillofacial Surgery at our school. He's a trained maxillofacial surgeon, and he also has enriching experiences both internationally and nationally. Uh, some of his fields of interest are facial trauma, facial cosmetic surgery, dental implant, dental alveolar surgery, among many others. Welcome, Dr. Naran, and welcome, Dr. Lanita, and thank you for presenting to us. We look forward to your presentation. 
And thank you for that. And I see Dr. Rankar has joined as well. Um, Dr. Rankar, are you able to introduce? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Dr. Yashishri Rankar. I am the dental director at uh, Community Health Centers of South Central Texas in Gonzales. And I am happy to be a part of the hub team. And uh, uh, thank you for attending today. Thank you. Um, and I think we're ready, um, Dr. Narayan. Narayan, <laughs> sorry. Um, whenever you're ready, um, please take over. Um, slide sharing. Perfect. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining this afternoon during your lunch hour. Uh, we're going to keep it brief, uh, straight to the point, and uh, something that uh, is going to be useful for all of us to uh, uh, think about any time, you know, when you're going to uh, write down a medical consultation, uh, we're just going to keep the facts that are very relevant to putting down a, a good medical consult. And that's what we're going to try and do in this afternoon session, where uh, we're going to talk about some important factors that we need to keep in our mind uh, so that we write a very efficient medical consult. Uh, so this is something that we are all familiar with. Uh, we've been taught in the dental school, uh, but it's just that it's a good idea to revisit this once in a while so that we are very efficient in terms of the process. Uh, one minute. Just, just going to move the slide. I'm having some technical issue. Give me a second. All right. So this afternoon, we're going to look at three important components, you know, that are involved in what we call as an uh, appropriate medical consult uh, uh, letter. One is we have to be very familiar in terms of what are the commonly encountered medical conditions that we deal with in our clinical practice. So we're going to review some of the common ones and uh, understand the importance of knowing these medical conditions well before we can really start writing down a medical consult letter. The second component is how do we go about providing what we call as a clinical context to the patient while we are drafting the medical consult uh, letter? The third component is, while you're writing the medical consult letter, make sure that you think through the whole process in terms of the pre-operative, intraoperative, as well as the post-operative component of the dental treatment that you're planning to uh, proceed with. Uh, and then you compose the medical consult letter accordingly. And we're going to focus on these three sort of objectives. Uh, you know, we all know that we are, have an aging population in the US. You know, if you look at the recent census in 2020, we have about one in six people in the US who are 65 years and old. And as we all know, we are going to see more patients in our practice who, are, who have advancing age and who also have what we call as more uh, medically compromised conditions. So this is the reality that we're dealing with and something for us to be aware of uh, uh, in the coming years. If you look at the common medical conditions that we deal with, it can have a cardiovascular dynamic, it can have a pulmonary sort of dynamic, an endocrine, a renal dynamic. The key is when patients do present with, let us say, a cardiovascular disease, let's take, for example, a, a situation like hypertension, it's important for us to know what uh, is the control of the disease process, you know, how well controlled is the patient uh, uh, in terms of the blood pressure dynamic. So you have a patient, someone who comes into your practice, they might have a blood pressure of, let's say, 180 or 110 millimeters uh, of uh, what we call as millimeters mercury, now, another person who's got a history of uh, myocardial infarction having the same sort of value. Uh, or, and now these are two individuals who are a little different. You know, someone who's got a history of end organ damage compared to someone who doesn't have a history of end organ damage. 
so the numbers mean something, but what is that excess baggage that the patient is carrying with them also means a lot in terms of the disease process itself. So someone who comes into our practice with either hypertension or coronary artery disease, it's important for us to not only identify the disease, but also quantify the disease process. And uh, this is where the medical consult comes in very handy, you know, in terms of uh, asking the appropriate questions to the physician in terms of the disease control as well as the disease uh, status. Uh, you know, patients who have a history of, uh, let's say, uh, unstable angina, you're more worried about the fact that, that they are at an increased risk for developing an MI during dental treatment compared to someone who's having a stable angina, who's uh, or taking the appropriate medications in terms of nitroglycerin on a regular basis. So medically compromised patients, either they have a cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, or endocrine disease, the first dynamic for us is to find out how well controlled the disease process is or how poorly controlled it is. And this is where the medical concept letter comes in handy. Uh, we have uh, to be aware of these disease processes. We have to be aware of the guidelines that comes in terms of the American Dental Association or from the appropriate authorities in terms of uh, the appropriate dental management guidelines for these patients who are medically compromised so that once we have that adequate knowledge, we can draft an appropriate letter to the physician. So uh, as clinicians, be wary of what we call as different disease processes uh, that the patient might present with. As you can see, we have a plethora of medical conditions that the patient can come into your uh, clinic and it's our responsibility to find out what we need to do. And if example for a bleeding disorder could be with someone who has a hemophilia A, B, or C, you know, someone who has hemophilia B, we need to figure out that the patient has deficiency in factor nine. Uh, so we need to find out how uh, well treated they are or how deficient they are in the uh, clotting factor deficiency and then work with the hematologist and uh, write the appropriate consult letter and then manage the patients effectively. So this is what we need to do. First, be wary of all the different type of medical conditions and then uh, write an appropriate letter so that you can work with the physician and take good care of your patients. <clears throat> so as clinicians, we have to be really updated in terms of all the uh, new trends in terms of management of these medically compromised patients, understanding what laboratory tests that we should request, what laboratory uh, tests that needs to be ordered by the physicians, and how do we interpret the uh, uh, laboratory tests. We have to have a thorough understanding of the different type of medications that the patient takes, what is the drug interactions of these medications on the uh, uh, type of treatment that we're going to provide. For example, someone is on, on an oral anticoagulant. We know that they are at an increased risk of post-operative bleeding. So we should have a good idea as to the half-life of those drugs. Uh, and then, you know, every day you're going to have a new sort of drug that comes into the market, which obviously uh, is actually uh, hailed as the best and uh, the greatest, but we should be aware of all the dynamics of these new drugs that come into play. Uh, and that's why the American Dental Association management guideline that comes regularly uh, is very, very useful for us to uh, have as a base when it comes to understanding about the appropriate recommendation before we actually go down and start writing the medical consult letter. So in this presentation, I talk about the fact that we need to provide appropriate clinical context to the physician while we write a medical consult letter. What I imply by that is we should give the physician all the information that we are aware of the case. You know, the patient presents with medical conditions. So in the medical consult letter, we need to tell the patient, uh, patient's physician that, hey, we know that the patient has the following medical conditions. This is our physical assessment of the patient. And that's where we write down the MET score, which is the metabolic equivalent uh, score. Uh, and we communicate to the patient's physician saying that, hey, this patient to, came to my clinic and the patient says they have the following medical conditions based on my physical evaluation. This is my assessment in terms of the physical status of the patient. This is what we are planning to do in terms of the dental treatment. And we are planning to also administer the following medications to these patients. And this gives the physician a good idea of what our understanding of the cases so that they can appropriately make the necessary recommendations to us 
based on our understanding of the case as well as our proposed dental treatment uh, that we are going to offer to our patient. So this clinical context is so, so important when we are trying to uh, draft out a medical counsel letter. So we have to be very, very thorough with this uh, concept of providing this clinical context when it comes to drafting a medical counsel letter. Some guidelines for us to quickly review. It's not something that uh, we are not aware of. It's something to think about anytime you're going to draft a medical counsel letter. You know, it's a good idea to think through the process of patient management that occurs before, during, and after the proposed dental treatment. So that means anytime you start to pin down a medical consult letter, ask appropriate questions or clarifications that you need to uh, put to the physician for all the three phases of the treatment, that is the preoperative phase, the interoperative phase, as well as the postoperative phase. So this way, you are very thorough in terms of the whole spiel of the medical counsel letter. Just don't focus on the preoperative phase. Uh, it's important to address all these three phases in your head and then start pinning down uh, what we call as a medical counsel letter so that you get all the appropriate responses, you know, for all the three phases of the treatment uh, that you're planning to provide to your patient. So in the preoperative phase, let us say, what are the things that we want the physician to tell us? Hey, tell us about the disease identification. We want to know if this is what the patient has in terms of the medical disease process. Do they have anything else that we should be aware of? Uh, how bad is the disease? You know, that's where the disease quantification comes into play. Uh, is the patient well-controlled diabetic, poorly controlled diabetic? Is the patient having... Uh, a severe sort of angina situation is more of a stable angina situation. So we're trying to quantify and find out what the physician has to say. And similarly, if the patient has any prosthetic or therapeutic device, we would like to really get clarifications in black and white from the physician as to what type of device the patient has. Because not all patients are great historians, as we all know. So it's important to get it from the horse's mouth in terms of what is actually going on with the uh, patient. Similarly, the medications, you know, patients sometimes give you a list of medications that they take. It's not a bad idea to check with the physician if there are other medications that the patient takes uh, that the patient has probably omitted. Uh, we also need to get the most updated medication list from the patient's physician and the medical consult letter is a very good sort of place where you can ask these questions. If you're planning to use sedatives or other type of uh, medications in terms of uh, taking care of the patient's anxiety. It's not a bad idea to discuss with the physician saying that, hey, we are planning to use these medications uh, or we okay in terms of us initially going and prescribing these medications on these medically compromised patients. It's not a bad idea to discuss that with the physician in that medical consult letter. We have potential interactions with drugs. You know, as I talked about earlier about patients taking oral anticoagulants, we are concerned about prolonged bleeding. So if you're going to ask for a drug holiday, might as well uh, think about that while you address that letter to the physician. You know, I'm going to do multiple dental extraction and we are uh, expecting a lot of uh, prolonged uh, post-operative bleeding. So based on the patient's medical condition, is it okay for us to uh, uh, stop the drug or if I'm going to give a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, is this appropriate for us to prescribe this drug? And it's something that is not uh, uh, bad in terms of throwing this out to the physician so that we can get their appropriate recommendation. We know that there are some drugs that cause prolonged uh, 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 sort of uh, bleeding, as I mentioned, and also problems in relation terms of medication-related osteonecrosis. So, Whatever questions that we need to put, it's the best time to park it in the medical consult uh, letter. That's why we have to have those considerations in the preoperative phase uh, uh, that needs to be cl clearly articulated and cleverly articulated in the medical consult letter. As a clinician, we have to ask about the appropriate uh, laboratory tests. It could be a liver function test. It could be a thyroid function test in a patient who has hyperthyroidism or appropriate uh, renal function test in someone who's got renal dysfunction, you know, ask about the most recent laboratory tests and find out if they have any significant alterations in terms of the values or not. 
And again, this is something that we need to address in the preoperative phase of the treatment so that you can manage the patients in terms of appropriate medications that we can give. You know, there's a concept of what we call as halving of the dose. You know, in someone who's got a poorly functioning kidney or poorly functioning liver disease processes, we do what we call as halving the dose. So these are questions that we can put to the patient's physician when you are constructing the letter, saying that, hey, this patient has renal dysfunction and I'm planning to use the following medication. Uh, considering the fact that the patient has this uh, amount of renal dysfunction, can we half the dose in this patient? It's something that you can articulate during uh, the medical consult letter at this phase. Uh, similarly, if there are any investigations that needs to be done, if you want to review it, it's a good idea to put those uh, in the preoperative component of the uh, what we call the medical consult letter. So basically, what are we trying to do? Before we start the procedure, we want to know if the patient's current overall health is stable for us to initiate treatment or not. If there are any medical conditions that is not disclosed by the patient. Uh, and can this patient be treated either in an outpatient setting in the dental office or the patient needs more of a controlled setting in a hospital setting? So these are the questions that we would like to ask in the preoperative phase of the uh, what you call a medical consult letter. In terms of the interoperative phase, if you have questions related to stress reduction protocol, uh, and if you think that the patient needs an anxiolytic option, and if you're planning to give some anxiolytic drugs, not a bad idea to check with the physician about the fact that, hey, you're planning to administer the following type of uh, uh, anti-anxiety medication, uh, with the patient would be accommodative of this. Uh, similarly, could be related to antibiotics as well, and also patients who are taking uh, what we call as uh, uh, who are going to need IV sedation. It's a good idea to discuss about the drugs that you're planning to use and then get the opinion from the physician if they're okay with us to administer the drugs, considering the fact that they have significant hepatic dysfunction or a renal dysfunction, getting the physician's blessing is not a bad idea. That's why it's important to think about that component while you're writing the medical consult uh, so that the patient's physician understands that, hey, this is what the dentist is going to administer and they can give their green signal for us to initiate uh, those medications. Similarly, post-operative, if you're planning to give antibiotics or pain medications, we need to discuss that also in the medical council letter so that the patient's physician understands that, hey, this patient is going to receive these medications and based on our uh, proposed, what we call as prescriptions, the physician can say, yes, we can go ahead and give the necessary medications at this particular dose. I always tell this to my students as well as uh, uh, my colleagues that, hey, it's not a bad idea to seek guidance in terms of dosages when it comes to renal or hepatic dysfunction, uh, because how bad the renal dysfunction or, or the hepatic dysfunction is, is something that the physician knows better than us. We can look at the uh, liver function test or renal function test. It gives us a good idea. But to work with them closely on these dosages is not a bad idea, uh, so that they can guide us in terms of uh, what would be the appropriate dose and how long we can prescribe the drugs as well. And as you can see, once you have the pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative components nicely woven into the letter, you will be able to get all the pertinent information that is necessary to work on the patient from the physician. So always try to connect those three phases and think through the three phases before you really start pinning down the medical consult letter. If there's one thing that we can get out from this presentation is that just don't focus on the preoperative component of the medical consult letter. Please focus on all the three phases of the treatment and ask all the relevant questions. The questions is something that we need to think through clearly and cleverly and then articulate it on a uh, medical consult letter clearly and cleverly so that we don't miss out on valuable information that the physician can share with us. So while doing so, we really are able to work well with the patient physician. You know, this is going to enhance our working relationship with the physician. It will help us to establish a good rapport with the physician. Uh, and when you're trying to do this medical consult letter, just make sure that we don't make it too elaborate to the point that, you know, we don't value the physician's time. It has to be simple, but still very effective. Um, I always say that we should be careful about avoiding unnecessary dental jargon because the 
the physician is not really aware of some of these dynamics in terms of the dental terminology. So I think we should be careful about all this extra uh, dental jargon that we are planning to use on the medical consult letter. So make sure that we identify the appropriate physician whom we need to address the letter to, make sure that uh, we understand that this medical consult letter serves as a record of patient history, but also it helps us defend also legally, you know, uh, very, be wary of the fact that this letter could be read by not only the patient, but also by his attorney in case, you know, things uh, turn from bad to ugly in terms of how, how the patient sometimes, you know, can uh, uh, react. So make sure that the medical consult is very professionally written and understand that there is a medical legal component associated in terms of how we have to think through when you're writing this medical consult letter. So as I said, let's keep the medical consultation letter simple and succinct, but it should be streamlined in such a way that it is very easy for the physician to read. For example, if you're trying to check on the patient's blood pressure situation, we can say, hey, doc, what is the patient's blood pressure goal or range? And if there is anything that concerns you regarding the treatment that I'm proposing based on the patient's cardiac status. It needs to be very simple and succinct. This helps the physicians to understand that we are trying to keep it very, very simple, but still the questions are very effective in terms of us asking uh, about the patient's suitability for the dental treatment. So in summary, when you're writing the medical consult, we need to make sure that we get appropriate responses in terms of disease identification from the physician, disease quantification in terms of how severe the disease is, details of the medications that the patient's uh, patient takes, details of devices that the patient has that we need to get clarification from, and also get appropriate management recommendations in terms of the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative management uh, from the physician. And if you have this dynamic in place, your medical consult letter is going to be very, very effective. And, you know, this really helps us to promptly recognize any significant medical problem that the patient has. It will help us to plan the appropriate treatment. And this way, you know, we can minimize the chances for medical emergencies that can occur during dental treatment. And this is why going through the pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative phase of the whole treatment that you're going to provide to your patient is something that's so, so, so critical. And that is the take home that I want you all to be aware of uh, in terms of writing down a very effective medical consult letter. A simple template could be uh, as shown in this particular slide, you know, where we say, hey, dear doctor, we are having to, uh, we're going to treat our patient uh, and based on the medical history, that I have, we need some additional input from your office and you can list down the medications that the patient takes, the medical conditions that they have listed to you and what is the dental treatment that you're planning to provide and what sort of information that you need from the physician. And again, when you're doing this, uh, uh, what we call as information that is requested, it's important to think through the pre-operative, intraoperative and the post-operative components of care that we want to provide to the patient. Uh, now, I've been a bit fast in this presentation because of want of time. I wanted to share a lot of information, uh, but I'm sure that once we start connecting the dots in terms of the pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative phases of the treatment, and uh, this will help us to really construct a good, solid medical consult letter. Uh, Dr. Landetta is going to share a case example that we have put together, which would reinforce this dynamic that I was talking about in terms of thinking through all the three phases of the dental treatment. Thank you uh, for being patient in terms of me going through a boom, boom, boom presentation, but there's so many slides, so many to discuss. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer now, or we can do it at the end of the presentation. Thank you Hello, so much. Hello, I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you for your presentation as for a significant uh, consideration that we have on a regular basis. Uh, what I was wondering is commonly will individuals will come in and they will have list who their who their providers are. They're not always so sure the uh, uh, their primary care physician and several specialists, uh, and that gets a little confusing. 
would you share your uh, your uh, interest and input on how to find out who we need to share the clearance with or uh, all all of the all of the providers uh, that are involved I would start off with the primary care physician who would uh, be able to guide us because if the patient is unsure about uh, the details about his specialist, I think the primary care physician would be a good sort of uh, uh, person to connect with and get their guidance as to who the patient is seeing in terms of the specialty care. And then uh, in keeping the primary care physician and the specialty uh, specialist involved in the loop is a good idea. Uh, this way, uh, uh, the primary care physician who's managing the overall health situation of the patient is also uh, aware of our concerns and, uh, and is going to work in coordination with us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy and Dr. Mario. Um, that was a great question. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Um, before we move on to the case presentation. I have a question, it's a little different. Uh, sometimes we get requests for a dental clearance before performing any uh, cardiac procedure or any knee replacement, joint replacements, et cetera. So is it safe to assume at that time that the provider has already looked at the risks and benefits of providing dental care before uh, they do their procedure, or should we also ask uh, the provider for a medical consult? Before? I mean, I, I think that's a great question, Doc. You know, the, the way I look at it is the our medical evaluation in terms of the physical evaluation or a detailed medical history that we take from the patients as well as assessment of the patient's past medical history is critical. So although they say, please provide the dental treatment, we have to review the medical history in detail. We have to go through a proper pre-op evaluation. All the uh, red flags need to be properly dotted down. And if we have any concerns, we should obviously ask the physician about those concerns uh, rather than falsely assuming that everything is okay. Uh, we do our due diligence and if we have doubt, send out a consult letter again because the physician will easily say, well, I wish you had asked me this question, you know? So if you're in doubt, ship it out and get the necessary clarification so that we have peace of mind, you know, before we start treating our patients. Thank you. Hello, hello again. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is along the same lines as Dr. Yaronkar's question, uh, but sometimes I know we get requests for on our end, from from the patient or a another provider or institution where sometimes a transplant is an issue transplant uh, for for an organ organ transplant and a question is posed or a general question gets posed to uh, make sure the patient is has no dental infection that question is almost word for word in that way we want to have, make sure the patient is cleared of any dental infection. So my question is certainly <clears throat> how to provide the best answer for some expe expedient treatment for this patient who's come up for a transplant. When you can see that there is still evidence of perio periodontal problems, there may yet still be some caries, but yet the infection is not, is not uh, discomforting nor, nor profound at the moment, but there is the presence. Um, in fact, the answer is there's still that presence. Uh, do you have a way to look at that? Well, the thing is, it's like what you're saying, chronic infections, whereas someone has got an acute infection, right? I mean, if you have a chronic periodontitis, obviously it's a chronic process. And now is that going to, uh, uh, is, is there a way for you to treat it or you know, if you are you planning to actually take out teeth, I minimum mean, if you need to extract teeth, if you feel that it's, you reach a situation where you're not able to salvage it, and if someone is needing a clearance, then we have to make a decision based on the situation. I look at it as an acute problem and a chronic problem. Anything that is acute, we need to take care of it before we can initiate what we call as the organ transplant. Chronic situations, you know, uh, it's something that we need to keep an eye on it, and it's not as critical compared to the acute sort of situations when it comes to the odontogenic infections, you know? 
Well, thank you. Yeah, I like that. I that uh, that um, description. That difference between acute and chronic in those use in there. If it's chronic, we can just make that statement. Acute problem is being resolved. A uh, chronic problem is under management. Maybe that's right. an answer, kind of like that. I, I will. I will add. Sorry, this is Doctor Landa. I, I will add also if you evaluation and you can anticipate that this specific lesion or curious can progress, especially you're talking about patient with uh, going to a transplant or maybe other kind of chemotherapy uh, or treatment, if you anticipate that this lesion is going to develop and cause an acute infection and then you have to treat it too, then that's part of, the part of you as a clinician to try to evaluate very, very well the patient, right? Any other questions? All right. So Dr. Dr. Landeta is going to present his component of the lecture. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, let me switch uh, presentations. All right, hello everyone. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to all the Dent Eco uh, team to put this together, uh, very organized and, and then uh, we're very happy to be able to participate. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, my part of the presentation is gonna be very short. This is just a case that I, uh, we put together to show you and you know, as a continuation of what Dr. Narayan has been explaining. And then now kind of put it together to see how it look when we're seeing a patient. Of course, this patient um, is based in 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 our practice that we do oral surgery. Okay, now you have to trans you know pull this to what you do in in, in your practice in your everyday practice. Okay, and then this is a patient, um, a, a female that is uh, fifty three years old that uh, she um she she, she just came to our our, our, our clinic uh, uh, complaining pain in number three and, and actually number two also, but mainly in number three that it's been painful for 2006. This this kind of detail when you take the medical history is important because it's telling me, well, uh, how acute is this pain or this is something that has been chronically causing discomfort and now she finally decided to do something about. Um, but um, reviewing the medical history and then we see uh, this patient have a multiple disease, right? And this is something that, as a Dr. Narayan, Narayan mentioned, patients are living longer and getting a lot more disease, and then you see this list of problems, right? And then hypertension, an autoimmune blood clotting disorder that she doesn't remember the name, had no idea what is the name. Um, and then uh, also report, very important for us, a three or four uh, TIAs, uh, uh, she was admitted, admitted at the hospital to, um, for two days in November. The first episode that she reported was in 2022. And then um, in 2023, she, she reported having more and more uh, often. She was uh, seen for, um, for his uh, primary care physician and also uh, for a neurologist and uh, put it in treatment for that. Also, report to us a DBT in the right arm. Um, and, and then I, I left this space here just to, you know, to to to, to show you that uh, those are primi pre probably the primary concern for us. Uh, besides what she has this Hashimoto, uh, um, thyroiditis, Sjogren syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, anxiety, depression, and other problems that are, yes, are concern for me, uh, but I understand this, uh, these medical issues and then uh, we can manage it not necessarily with a medical console, right? Um, another point that is important, well, the medication she's taking, she, is this a good way to know uh, is she is telling us the whole story or was missing something in the whole picture, right? And then she's taking Sintroid, that makes sense because the, the thyroiditis that she had, that caused hypo, hypo, uh, thyroidism. Uh, they had two medication for um for an anxiety and and um, medication for blood pressure, and um, bloody pain and and taking only cl clopidogrel that is well known as a plavix right that uh, we know that it's an antiplatelet. 
Uh, also, that is important. Um, she reported having um, an, an anaphylactic reaction with NSAID um, and other uh, side effects with other medication and environmental uh, allergies. When we progress in the medical history, then she seems to be, when you check vitals, we seems to, to be a very stable patient with a, a well-controlled um, blood pressure, not concerned, not too much concern for all, pulse okay, respiration okay, that, and she, for what she told us in the, in the, during the, 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 the interview, she, she, she meet the criteria to be more than four meds. Um, in trial, she presents no swelling and any asymmetry. Then I'm trying to go to all this detail because this is important information that we need to know to make decisions. Either, either, even if a, uh, if it's an emergency or an urgent uh, treatment, or is something that is elective and we can delay it somehow. Uh, Internally, again, no swelling, no sign of tract. She reported that, uh, you know, she had uh, some kind of uh, a drainage long time ago, but nothing active, no right now uh, active. And then decay number two and number three. Then for us, the diagnosis is just grossly curious two and three that she was all she was offered for a previous de a dentist to restore those teeth, but she decided for, for financial reason to don't uh, don't say those teeth. And then our plan was a surgical extraction of, of two and three. I want to show here the X-ray um, because also it's important for us to determine well this is a simple procedure, but this is a procedure that potentially can be a little more complex. Be become surgical, uh, the potential to have a sinus communication. And then we had to determine how severe, how how uh, um, severe is a is a procedure or or that we wanna we wanna do in in, in this patient. And then knowing this, okay, and then we have all our medical history, um, and this is why I want you to start. You know, after this lecture, this is our goal for you to start asking yourself um, different question, and then. Can we proceed with the surgical stressing? Is, is we are ready? Is, is my only concern right now is just the the procedure, the surgical procedure. Is this only that? Well, yes, it's surgical. I had to section the tools. Da 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 da. You can put it together, right? Uh, now, is is there anything else that concerns us about this patient, especially when we talk about the medical finding? And then, as I mentioned, yeah, they have some other issues that the patient has that are for when you are talking with the patient, you you know that the story is not complete, right? Something, some pieces are missing there, and we talk that in a minute. Um, and then, um, yes, I, I I have a concern for some medical uh, issues, right? And then, well, the other question will say, well, what is your concern? And then. Yes, I ha I have a, a out autoimmune uh, um, a clotting uh, DC that we don't have name for that. We don't know exactly what is happening. The only thing that we we know is the patient is having multiple episodes of of uh, TI and then DVT that uh, it has been affecting the patient severely, especially the last year. 20, in this case, it was twenty twenty three that she had to be she had to be admitted for that. Actually, the first episode she didn't have any any uh any symptoms it was a a, um, a radiographic finding when she was uh, taking some um exam for um for the rheumatoid arthritis and they they found out this and after that they have more complication with this kind of problem right there could be one the other, the other one is the patient is really i mean control with the with the hashimoto um and in um in in a hypertension looks like a patient is taking her medication now Knowing this, should we request a medical consult before the procedure or we feel safe to do the procedure uh, without that? Uh, I think we, we know that question, that answer, right? I think, yes, I, I think we have some concern and we need to know, know a little bit more. Uh, my concern primarily in this case, of course, because I'm doing a surgical procedure, is going to be the risk of bleeding because the patient is taking an antiplatelet, right? Uh, now, is an autoimmune immune, uh, clotting uh, disorder without, without name? Uh, we know that it's different kind of disorder, but uh, I feel like I'm missing one piece. I mean, it's, it's taking only antiplatelets. What kind of disorder is this? We are missing maybe one medication that is an anticoagulant also that is 
in onboard and we are not aware, those are kind of the thing that you have to think at the same time that you are uh, interviewing your patient. And then la and the last thing is, well, what are we gonna ask the physician? I mean, what kind of question we, we, we're gonna ask, what, uh, what, what exactly we need to know from, from him, right? Or, or for the, or the doctor. All right, and then following the same uh, way that Dr. Um, Naraya mentioned, we need uh, to go to the, all the phases because, I mean, we, it's not about just, okay, what is going to happen during the surgery? We need to go through preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative to take care of completely about our patient. And preoperative, yes, I have a concern about my autoimmune blood disorder, about, about my TIA and DVTs. The patient have current labs. Do I need to request any complementary exam like a CTs or um, other exam that, uh, um, that that help me to to make decisions? Uh, this is actually the whole medication list of the patient, or we're missing anything. And then, do I have to also uh, think about my stress reduction protocol because the patient have a severe anxiety? Um, that is very common also seeing in patients here coming to, to our surgery, right? And then, yes, is many things that I'm thinking about, right? And then when we see the whole picture about the preoperative, we have, uh, I want to bring the medical history and then you can, you know, follow me with this. Um, I put in red, what, what are my main concerns, right? Um, hypertension, but seeing control, autoimmune disease, all the, the, the coagulation problem that she has, and of course, anxiety. And then how Dr. Naraya mentioned, and this is identification, understanding what is happening. Uh, if this if the patient is not a good historian, we need to ask, okay, I need more information about the medical history and detailed medication. That brings us also a possible sedation consideration, drug, drug interaction, and how the healing is going to impact, knowing that uh, some of this disease can impact in a, in a, in, in, in our healing process. You know, we know the corpidal goal can cause postoperative bleeding and then we need to take care of that and they can delay the healing and then from that we can go to an infection and then we need to know well we need antibiotic too how are we going to manage this patient and then um now we move, move to the intraoperative and then what could be concerned for me yes intraoperative bleeding pretty much or if the patient have any chance to have another TI, TI8 in or thromboembolism during my procedure, or is the patient stable and then safely we can proceed with the with the surgery. Of course, also bleeding, of course, and a stress reduction during the procedure. And I had to know which kind of option I can I can offer my patient. Is just nitrous okay? I need to do maybe oral sedation pre-op or um, I mean anxiolytic pre-op. Oh, I need to, re I mean, maybe recommend some IV sedation for my patient. Um, and then um, it's very clear what, what what is my concern and what we are thinking in the intraoperative. And of course, uh, the next phase would be postoperative, where pretty much is bleeding and pain management, especially because this patient have a an aphylactic rash for NSAIDs, right? And then uh, depending on what, how much trauma we expected to cause during the procedure, we need to be sure that we have a very good backup on, on pain, pain management for this patient. And of course, any bleeding postoperative, and then we need to follow this patient closely. And then again, um, postoperative, this is what we had to, uh, I mean, may, mainly consider drug considerations uh, and to treat this, do, do I need to prescribe antibiotic? Now, um, we have the template that Dr. Narayan uh, uh, used. I mean, you can probably create your own template using kind of this as a guy, depending on what, what you do, uh, but this is a good way. And then I like what Dr. Narayan mentioned, keep it simple, uh, but with relevant information, right? You don't need to, to write a whole story of anything. You have to be, cons I mean, very relevant, very important information. For the for the doctor to understand, they don't need to know that you're gonna prep a cavity that is class two, and then you two millimeter here there because they don't know about that. They don't care. They're not gonna even read it. And then uh, it just just important information. Um, and then I I just put this because this is what we we don't want from 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 the doctor to to send it back, right? And then we don't want this answer that look here in the bottom and say clear. This doesn't doesn't tell me anything. Uh, if we read a little bit about, I mean, this this console, you you can see that uh, 
the the daughter who who wrote this that it wasn't specific what what they want to know. They say we, we want your help to see if I can do this, and the doctor respond clear that doesn't tell me anything. And then I'm in the same spot that we need to avoid that. It's very uncommon. It's very rare that we request a clearance for our procedure, right? For especially minor surgery or dentistry, we don't we don't request clearance. Okay. Um, then this is an example specific for this patient. Then we have, a, a, this is our referral. You see, it's very simple following this template. We see during my routine examination, a mutual patient in December 23, you know, recorded medical history with additional input from your office. And then um, patient have report to us that she had the following medical condition, you know, the medical condition that we already mentioned, right? And then the patient have hypertension, autoimmune blood disorder, yeah, taking all this medication, we are expecting to this, do this dental treatment. It's a surgical extraction, all right? No, those numbers with local anesthesia, with epi. Then what would we need to know? Well, I would like Kenley to provide you uh, us to detail of her, you know, history of the TAAs, right? To see exactly what is happening with that, how uh, how uh, is really three or four that being happening or it's just an isolated event with no major complication. This is a patient with a high risk of develop another of this uh, disorder, right? Uh, and what kind of autoimmune uh, coagulation disorder the patient has. Um, another, also I would like to, to know if the patient needs to have another medical condition that I'm, I mean, I'm not aware of and the patient didn't tell me, uh, or medication. And uh, very common in this case, of course, the cardiac issues is not major, but always for us is the patient current cardiac status. The patient able to support this stress of surgery and, and be stable, right? Um, and then thank you for this valuable help in, in the team. Now, you see it's very concise, very precise. Do, more likely, uh, are we getting all the answer for these questions? The reality is most of the time we don't. We we get a specific answer, but if, it, but if this answer, it kind of fill the you know the the doubt that, that we are or the or, or the question that we know about this patient to proceed. We do if no, well we call that we call the doctor and we can speak directly with, with them. This is what the what the answer that we have that there's no contraindication for this patient to have dental procedure based on patient medical and neurologic history. And then this 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 uh, um, um, this uh, consult went to the PCP and, and neurosurgeon. And then a neurologically no history and they mean don't have major damage with these events of, of, of clotting. But if you read, however, on the no circumstance should patient have her plavis stop it. I mean in in their mind, there's no major no major consequence, but it's a high risk of this patient. I mean, we can know we need to deal with the bleeding. Can we, we deal with that? Yes, we can. Um, and then um, and then uh, and then this is in in the surgical uh, uh, um standpoint is enough for me to to proceed because that will be probably my main concern. Um, and it is clear that he's taking only the plavis and not all the anticoagulant. Um, now, as a summary, I, I want to just bring back the same uh, the same uh, slide that Dr. Narayan mentioned is uh, the C identification, the C quantification, medication and devices. Uh, Does they have any device, implant device uh, in the patient? It's important to, to have this clear. Sometimes we go too fast in medical history, we can miss some area of this. Um, the management that you have to think, no, don't don't set your mind only to think about during the procedure. You have to think about what I'm going to do pre, intra, and post-operative. That is the way that we have to treat our patient, and they have to consider all this. Uh, of course, identif identify potential complications. And what happened? I mean, if the patient is such you know, possible times communication, I'm gonna also prescribe antibody to cover this part because I could happen or medical medical uh, complication in their case. Um now this is my last slide. If you have any any question for us, we're open for questions. We don't have too much time, but uh, um 
thank you so much for for this opportunity. And then uh, if we have maybe a few minutes for questions. I don't know. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Alameda, for walking um, us through your thought process. That was very helpful. Um, let's open up the floor for uh, to questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, please feel free to chime in um, or type it in the chat. Hi, I don't have a question. I just like to, would, to say something. I've been a dentist for 41 years. And I've primarily worked on HIV and AIDS patients most of that time. And I've seen a lot of medically complex patients. And one thing I would like to stress is even if you have dental clearance from a physician, you really need to use your own clinical judgment at the time of the procedure. Because sometimes you'll get dental clearance and the patient will look really, really weak um, or frail and may not really be a can, the physician may have missed something. So you have to use your own clinical judgment uh, at the time of, of your doing a procedure. I'd just like to say that I almost had a patient die on me one time from a cardiac condition. I think that is a, is a, that's a very valid comment and and then everybody had to be aware that um, a clearance that is, is doesn't, doesn't uh, save you for any liability you, you also are li liable for that and then your medical your medical knowledge and your clinical uh, uh, you know evaluation and, and knowledge is important to put in practice and know know exactly what you what you had to do when you had to uh, how to how to manage this patient and then again I always mention this is 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 the response is not what you are looking for. You need more information. Go and call and talk with the physician. Because sometimes they are busy, they see some dental console and they think, well, this is probably something simple. And then they just barely read and they just sign in and that's it. I've and seen referral that is the sign of the um, console, sign of the physician and send it back with only the signature. That is a little bit unprofessional, but this is what we have. But yes, this is a very valid and 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 it's very important what you mentioned here. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello. Hey, Dr. Landet. I really, oh, yeah. really appreciate you doing this for me. Um, I like the way you you're teaching us to do the console. I think being more precise, we get a better answer from the physician. Um, if I was to treat this patient, the same exact patient in, let's say next month, should we go again and send another, um, console? I, I will. On file? Yeah. Well, it depends on the time. And then you, you have to interview your patient. You see that, that, that path too much time from the initial console. I will talk with the patient. Is any changes in the med, in the medical history recently? And depend what how you get the answer from the patient, and then now is the is a is it more than six months and a year? I probably will send send it if the patient is not good historian and tell me what is what is happening. That is very common though. That we we have patients that are, I always tell the student we have like a three type of patient: the patient that come here with the folder and all the medical history with detail, the patient that tell you a little bit, and then if you ask that they tell you more, or the patient that doesn't talk. And then, uh, yes, it's, I think it's a pain how, how good historian is a patient is. It's more than six months. I probably gonna, I wanna request a new, a new one. And it's a good question because sometimes when you have these very medically compromised patients, uh, you know, recent events, you know, between the different appointments is something that we need to check, you know? There's a possibility that the medical consult ref, uh, response that you got uh, is dated January 2024, and between January 2024 to February, what if the patient has developed another transient ischemic episode that necessitated hospitalization and care? So it's an excellent question. We need to make sure that there's no change between the last visit to this visit, that the status quo is the same. Then we can initiate the care based on the response from the previous medical consult response. However, if there has been a change, then obviously, you know, we need to uh, get another opinion. Yep. And um, 
because I've been working as faculty here, I've seen some patients that they ask for the console to be printed, and then they uh, they state that they're gonna take it to their physician. They don't, and they sign it, and they like they can put clear, and then they sign it. That could be very, you know, not contradicting the physician we need, is bad. We need to be very careful with that because that happens, and I, I've seen that. Uh, I think uh, our, our responsibility is to take care directly with that. I would probably get information about the physician and the fax number. And if the patient wants a copy, I give you the copy, but I'm probably going to fax one copy to directly to the office, the, the, the doctor office. Okay. And I, I'm sure that I'm, I'm covering all size, you know. Thank you. Of course. I see that it's one. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat. Um, we can consolidate and ask um, Dr. Landeta and Dr. Narayan um, and get back to you. Um, Jackie, thank you. Would you be able to share the um, ending slides? Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us um, today. Um, please complete the post-session survey. Um, you'll be able to find the link to that in the chat. And also um, our next session is in March um, with Dr. Farrell and Dr. Contreras. Uh, we will be hearing on um, today, I am treating a person who has autism a social story about autism for dental professionals. And um, I'm not sure, Jackie, if you're able to pull up the flyer for our next session. I apologize. Um, to register, please um, scan the QR code you see there. Um, and we look forward to seeing you um, at our next session. Um, thank you so much to everybody today. Um, have a great rest of the day.